Hello and welcome to Teaching Stream. My name's Sam and I'm the minister here at Melton Mowbray Baptist Church. Teaching Stream is our Bible teaching ministry here at Melton Mowbray Baptist Church and is primarily intended to form the curriculum for our small groups. We love our small groups ministry here and we would encourage anyone who is part of Melton Mowbray Baptist Church to be part of a small group. If you'd like to find out more about small groups then do please speak to me on a Sunday or give us an email at M, uh, office at mmbc.org.uk. This week we continue with our series in the Minor Prophets and Diane Tibble is still with us. I'm sure that you're happy to know. Last week we looked at Zephaniah and this week we're going to be looking at Habakkuk. I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to hand over to Diane. Loving Father God, I pray that you would use Diane's words as we watch this to speak to our hearts, transform our souls and mould us to be ever more like your son, Jesus Christ. I ask that in the powerful name of Jesus himself. Amen. Please enjoy. Well, hello. It's uh, a privilege for me to be with you again today. Uh, thank you for having me in your homes and in your small groups as you share together. What a privilege it is to look at God's word, to reflect on it, to allow it to speak into our lives. And we're going to look at the book of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is a very real, authentic book. The prophet, uh, is not finding life easy at all, and that is an understatement. And he voices some of the things that you and I voice. Uh, things maybe we think we're not allowed to uh, voice before God, asking questions. But before I go any further, let me just suggest to you that actually in your readings that you read chapter 1, verses 2 to 13, chapter 2 verses 14 to 17 and chapter 3 verses 17 to 19. Chapter 1, 2 to 13, chapter 2, 14 to 17 and chapter 3, 17 to 19. We do live in a world of terrible turmoil, don't we? You don't have to look very far. Think about Afghanistan. Think about Syria. Think about the places of warfare and difficulty in so many different places in our, uh, our uh, globe. Think about Venezuela. People really in despair, wondering what is going on places of violence, places of forced labour akin to slavery, persecution of good people, the powerful taking advantage of the poor, the weak at the mercy of every political wind of change. In Habakkuk's day, it was no different. The people lived with fear, despair, suffering, death. It was the, day, uh, the days of the despotic King Jehoiakim, ruling Judah, God's people, with total injustice. He had no regard for compassion. He had no humanity or humility. All the spiritual reforms that King Josiah had introduced uh, a number of decades before were now history. People had gone back to their old ways and they were struggling. And all the people of faith, like Habakkuk, we're saying, God, can't you do something? Where are you in this? And so Habakkuk looks with despair at what is going on and he argues with God. He says, justice is a joke, God. But then when God answers him, that's a bit of a shock. And so then Habakkuk goes back again on the attack. And he says, this silence is deafening. Why won't you speak? Why won't you do something else? And this time God's response is chastening. And Habakkuk is humbled and realised who he's talking to. And then Habakkuk's faith 
is a salutary conclusion to this prophetic book and actually is a salutary challenge to all of us who struggle with life when things become just a little bit uncomfortable. And the words of Habakkuk at the end of the, his uh, prophecies are well known to us, I suspect, and they resound in our ears uh, clearly and with a note of hope and faith as well as challenge. So looking at uh, Habakkuk, the opening verses, chapter one, verses two to four, Habakkuk just says, look, God, justice is a joke. This is your world. Why are you allowing such things to go on? There is dishonesty. There is no calling to account. There is violence, no punishment, evil, duplicitousness. People are laughing all the way through life. All the evil ones are laughing and the holy, the good, they are suffering. They are taking the pain of it all. The poor and the vulnerable are the victims. Justice in the courts, in life, in whatever way you look at it, really is a joke. And, and forget social justice. Where is God's justice? Where are you, Lord, in all of this? God, you're supposed to be a God of mercy, of love, of grace, of compassion. Aren't you supposed to deal with evil? Aren't you supposed to deal with wrongdoers? Aren't you supposed to discipline those um, who step out of line? It's not happening, God. What's going on? Not only is justice a joke, God's justice is a joke. And it isn't just that Habakkuk doesn't see any change in the horrendous um, situation that surrounds him. The pain and the suffering just goes on and on. He doesn't see God answering his prayers. Habakkuk is a godly man. He's been praying and seeking God. Why does God put up with it? When God could do something about it, why does, doesn't things change in Afghanistan, locally to you maybe? People trapped by drug addiction and those who deal drugs, those who face domestic violence, those who are scammed all the time, day in and day out, we're hearing about it. People losing precious life sailing, savings, the disease, the brokenness, Justice, fairness, compassion, this can seem a joke when you are in the midst of it all. Where are you, God, in all of this? We might share Habakkuk's view that the law, justice is a joke. The courts are a joke. The violent, the dishonest, the abusive are winning. The good, the innocent, the vulnerable pay the price. Maybe that isn't your experience. I hope not. But sometimes even when just illness comes into our lives, we can't find God in it. A pastor friend of mine, her 12 year old daughter, has changed in a matter of months from being a delightful, charming uh, young lady moving into adulthood to being a total nightmare. Some kind of neurolo neurological disease has impacted her. Maybe it's Tourette's, maybe it's something else. They've had no diagnosis yet, but it's a nightmare for the whole family. The behavior of the daughter is without precedent. They don't know how to cope with her. They don't know how to love her. Where are you, God, in this? Well, God does answer and God answers Habakkuk in a very particular way, which possibly doesn't quite fit our situation. But in verses five to 11 of chapter one, he, uh, he challenges Habakkuk. I wonder if God had said to Habakkuk, so what do you want me to do, Habakkuk? How would you like me to act? Maybe Habakkuk would say, just bring it all to an end. Stop all the evil, stop all the bad things, stop all the disease, stop all the things that make us weep and cry. Deal with those who've stolen, been corrupt, been violent and hurtful. 
But then like the parable of the wheat and the tares, we discover if God does that, lots of innocent people are caught up in it as well. And we have to say that maybe God doesn't see individuals in the way that we do. We live in a very individualistic society today where what I personally feel, what I think, what my emotions tell me are what is authentic and right for me. No, the time of Habakkuk was a time where actually everybody was a community together. They starved together if time was bad. They rejoiced and celebrated together when things were good. When they disobeyed God and got things wrong, the community suffered. And so maybe God can see that his people have gone so far astray. They have gone so far from what is good and life enhancing. And only action which will impact the whole community can actually be worthwhile. There have been revivals. God has tried everything in the past. He's given them kings. He's given them other prophets. He's sent them a king who brings about renewal of the covenant. And that has been good, but only for a brief time. And then they turn back to their old evil ways. And they forget the God who loves them. And so God's solution is not what Habakkuk expected or would have wanted. God is going to use godless nations to um, punish his people. God is going to use the Babylonians like these are the worst people around the Babylonians. Anybody but the Babylonians, God, a fierce and ferocious nation, oppressive, recklessly building an empire at the expense of thousands of innocent people. They're described by Habakkuk as a people without morals, taking up rule, making up rules as they go along. They collect victims like squirrels, collect nuts. They are ruthless, powerful and merciless. Not them, God. Have you ever felt like that? God is not answering your prayers. And then somehow God seems to use the bad guys about to bring about consequences. But that means somehow we're all caught up in it. Or maybe you personally face an injustice. The whole process of the courts and interviews are worse than the original injustice. From an international perspective, God allows those who are godless to have their way. God can use China. God can use radical causes. He can use Russia to pass judgment on his people. And it's not comfortable. And it may, may be just as the prophet Habakkuk said, and he kind of prophesied what um, John, McGreg uh, John McEnroe would say in years to come. You cannot be serious. That's the message version, as you will understand. But we'll come on to that now. So what Habakkuk is living through is this sense that the God is not acting in the way he expected. God is far removed from what he hoped. And yet God says, this is my way and my purposes will be fulfilled. But I will do it not in a way that you expect and it will be comfortable for you. And so Habakkuk goes on in verses 12 and 13 of chapter one, and he suggests, look, the silence is deafening. Verse 13, why, why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? He's already been outraged, as I've said. You chose Babylon for your judgment work. You gave them the, jo uh, the job of discipline. You can't be serious. You can't condone evil. And so verse 13 goes on when Habakkuk says, do something, God. Yet you stand around and watch. You treat your people like fish in the sea, swimming without direction. The Babylonians arrive and they make a catch and they know that everyone will eat well that night because the hall is so great. Are you really going to let this continue, God? God of the universe. 
Is there any one of us who hasn't had thoughts like this at times? God, what are you doing? Why are you treating us with such seeming disdain? I know many people are not honouring you as they should, but we're all caught up in the appalling tragedy. Whether it's global warming, it doesn't just affect those who fly around um, uh, and emit loads of carbon into the air. It, it, It affects the poor and the vulnerable who've never been on a plane in their life, maybe. There are times when God's way seems very hard, very hard to understand, difficult to grasp, and frankly, it seems wrong. But you see, we just see a small part of what God is doing. We only see a tiny bit. If we could see the big picture, if we could understand everything that God was doing, we could see how this little bit in 2021 fits into God's eternal plan and his purposes for all of us. And so God's response is chastening. Habakkuk is very well aware that he has asked questions way beyond what might be respectful of God and humble before him. And he's actually a bit bashful himself. Chapter 2 and verse 1. What is God going to say to my questions? I am braced for the worst. I'll climb to the lookout tower and scan the horizon. I'll wait to see how God will answer my complaint. Touches of Job here, aren't there? Echoes of that. And God begins in chapter 2 and verse 4 by saying, look, look up, look at the man who is puffed up who is bloated with his own sense of self-importance. The people look at them who've strayed so far. They are so full of themselves, but their souls are empty. What a conclusion to draw from God. He looks at his people and he says, the majority of you, your souls are empty. There's a lot of it about, isn't there? A lot of empty soullessness. And and he kind of goes through, God does, goes through all the ways in which he sees this, the evidence for his uh, judgment, his assessment of the situation. He says, verse five and six, look, you've got people um, who just want to be rich and and they they get money by whichever means they can. They always want more. They steal from people. They extort from people but eventually their victims will turn on them. And frankly, they'll never be satisfied because money money never does satisfy. They recklessly grab and loot whatever they can lay their hands on. They engineer, an interesting way of putting it, they engineer the ruin of their own lives as they ruin others. They have ruined themselves. Oh, they've they made a mess of everybody else's life by their evil and selfish and deceitful behaviour. But actually what they've done is engineered their own ruin. There is no clear conscience, no good night's sleep. You'll wake up um, with a throbbing head and realise what a violation it has all been, God says, of people and of nations. When you've parted too much with too much drink, which leads to sex of all kinds, it's wrong, God says, and it's a disgrace. And one day you'll wake up and you'll realise what fools you've been. Your idols, they're just lumps of metal, lumps of wood. You think they will give you an answer. Of course they won't. It's no different today, is it? We see the rich, the powerful lining their own pockets. I think now Grenfell, where was it? So many people died in that horrific fire in that block of flats. No one's been held responsible for shoddy work, shoddy materials, which meant that so many died. And now thousands are left with flats that they are living in that they can't sell, that are going to cost more to repair than they paid for themselves. And there's no business 
has been made to pay. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The rich just want more. David Cameron, already richer than I suspect than most of us could ever dream of. Part of the Greensill scandal. If I understand correctly, and maybe the newspapers have got this wrong, I don't know. But he's made something like £7 million from a company that's gone bankrupt by getting people to invest in it, governments and others, and then taking loads of money out of it. And then they're just left with nothing. But the rich go away laughing their heads off. But it isn't just the powerful Actually, ordinary people, when they get the chance, they will take advantage of others. Our street crime, when there's rioting, it turns into looting, when people just take what isn't theirs, destroying local businesses, causing all kinds of suffering and mayhem. And it's not just the powerful who have uh, alcohol fueled parties which leads to all kinds of behaviour, sexual behaviour, which is a disgrace, God says, and leaving nobody satisfied, everybody hurt and broken. Our idols. Oh, we think we've made it, don't we? If we've got a nice house that's well maintained with all the latest designs and we've got a good car that people are impressed by whatever uh, make it is. We spend so, so much time making sure that we've got a nice house and a nice car and that we keep them maintained, that we put them before God. And before we know it, they are an idol. We've come to think that they matter. We've come to think that if we've got the house and the car and the holidays, oh, we'll be happy. We'll be someone special. No, learning contentment with God Learning contentment with him, honouring him in everything is the first step to true happiness. And so Habakkuk's words may be for many of us today. You have ruined others and in so doing you have ruined yourselves. And yet in chapter two, there's also a wonderful beam of light in the darkness. Verse four of chapter two says, while the puffed up and proud are soulless, the person who follows in God's ways, who is loyal to God and holds on to believing, they are fully alive. In other words, the person who has faith in God will find life. From the beginning, faith was the key to God's people. Abraham believed God's promises to him and his faith meant that God honoured and blessed him. And Abraham did everything he could to follow in God's ways. To have faith means simply to believe that God will fulfil his purposes. He will bring about his kingdom here on earth. And then to live out that belief, to live true to your belief to shape one's life, not according to the adverts that tell you to have bigger, better, sharper, newer, whatever, but to live according to the word of God, according to all that he says to us. That isn't easy when we live in a world that screams at us to have more, to live indulgently, to get away with what we can. It's the system, that's how things work, to do what we want because we are worth it. But faith is to believe that God's way is the best way, not the easy way, far from the easy way, but the best way. The second jewel in this chapter two uh, is this is verse 14. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Shall I say that again? The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God one day. The whole world will be aware of Almighty God and his love for us through Jesus Christ. One day that awareness will breathe excitement, joy and laughter into the lives of those who have lived by faith. Oh, it will be a day of reckoning for those who have not. But in the meantime, God may use nation against nation, 
He may use climate change or other means, but God's purposes will not be thwarted. He will bring his kingdom about. And then there is an exasperated plea from Habakkuk to God's people. In the vernacular, it says, shut up, everyone. Listen to God. He is present if you will just stop and listen. If you will just look for his holy presence. If you will just let God be God in your lives. If you will just honour him. If you will just live honestly and truthfully. Then you will know God. He will be your God and you will be his people. And God will be at work in your lives and the lives of your nations. So Habakkuk's faith concludes this um, prophecy, this little book of prophecy, and it's salutary to all of us. We have journeyed through Habakkuk with him questioning God about justice and unanswered prayer. Habakkuk has been shocked by God's proposed methods of disciplining God's people by using Babylon. And he asks God why he seems to be silent, why he doesn't speak more clearly. The silence is deafening. We've heard God's response, his condemnation of his people and how far they have drifted from him, their values and morals so far from all that God planned. And then we've seen the glimmers of light, no more than glimmers at times, maybe, as Habakkuk saw it, but a spotlight that says, despite all this, the people of faith will live and God's purposes will be fulfilled. And so we come to the final chapter, chapter three, Habakkuk's reflections on his encounter with God. And as we've already said, it's a Job moment. He's chastened and he's humbled by God. The questions were legitimate. The frustrations were real. Habakkuk had just forgotten that God is sovereign, that God is in charge of all of this, that God sees it all. Nothing uh, avoids his uh, awareness. He rules and he reigns. And if the evidence is hard to find in the current situation, Habakkuk has been made to think and reflect. In verse two of chapter three, he remembers all that God has done in the past. He knows that God is in control. His faith reminds him of God's power and presence and all thing, in all things. So he calls out to God and says, Lord, do it again. Do your wonderful deeds. Repeat them in our day. But always remember mercy, Lord, as you bring judgment, please remember kindness and compassion. In verse 13, he knows that God will save his people. He will deliver those who are the remnant, who keep faith, who are special to him. But he knows what is ahead. He knows that putting things right was going to be catastrophic. They're going to have to go through some very, very tough times. And so he speaks in anticipation of that by saying, my bones turn to water. I staggered and stumbled. I wait for doomsday. And then he looks around with every reason to despair. And the concluding verses, as the message puts them, says, though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm eaten and the wheat field stunted, the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns are empty. I'm singing joyful praise to my God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to God, my saviour, counting on God's rule to prevail. I take heart again and again and I gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. What a turnaround from the beginning of the book of Habakkuk. He has gone from being a questioning, belligerent, angry questioner of God to being a man who is once more understanding God is sovereign of all things. He is Lord of all things, worthy of all praise, worthy of all honour, worthy of all glory. God will bring his kingdom 
here on earth as in heaven. Despite massive opposition and evil, he will do what he has promised. And so Habakkuk has gone from despair and a critical spirit, from a demanding attitude to a place of faith. Whatever happens, I will trust God. Where are we with God at the moment? If I'm honest, I spend more time than feels helpful asking questions and wondering why God allows things. Underneath there is this faith that God is working out his purposes and some days it's so easy to see. And when we're worshipping together and hearing the truths of our faith, oh, it's, it's great. And we feel as though we're one step from heaven itself. On other days, not so. Perhaps the key is chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. A little more silence and acknowledging the glory of God and we would all be in a better place. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that as we wrestle with questions that we just don't understand, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would help us to know that your word is truth, that you are working out your purposes, that your kingdom is coming on earth as in heaven. Lord, may we receive your grace each day to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to engage with God's word, to really study it and to make it real in your life. May God bless you as you continue to reflect on the book of Habakkuk. Thank you.